This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. <laughs> As a healed, wounded healer, Having pulled herself through the trenches of trauma and recovery with IFS and other modalities, Michelle has a deep empathy and respect for those who are on their journeys to wholeness. She feels deeply honored to accompany clients on their healing journeys. Valeria interviews Michelle Glass, the author of Daily Parts Meditation Practice, a journey of embodied integration for clients and therapists. Michelle Glass is a certified Level 3 IFS practitioner and alternative counselor in Eugene, Oregon, who has 18 years of IFS experience and has accumulated over 380 hours of direct study with Richard Schwartz, PhD, the founder of IFS. She developed and is the author of The Daily Parts Meditation Practice, a journey of embodied integration for clients and therapists which has become a valued method of deep embodiment of the IFS model and healing integration. These tools of integration can now be found within the IFS-based app called Centaur. She released her DPMP MP3 set of meditations in early 2021. The DPMP has been trademarked, and in fall 2022, the Spanish version of the book and MP3 set of meditations will be released. In addition, she served as the editor for Outlook, the foundation for Self Leadership's magazine for seven years. She gives workshops across the globe. Meet Michelle at thelistenerllc.com. Here's the interview with Michelle Glass. In your own words, who is Michelle Glass? Hi, Valerie. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, who am I? In the terms of who I am in my deepest self, I'm a drop of the divine, just as we all are. Um, and I also have a bunch of different parts of me who facilitate a lot of my life. And in that realm, um, I am a certified IFS practitioner. Um, I have written a book that is very well received within the IFS community and now growing outside of that community um, on deepening healing and integration with IFS. Um, I am a mother, a wife, um, friend, um, sister, aunt, um, I'm a man, many, many things. Um, and at the heart of all of that, I'm a spiritual being here on this earth. I love that. Love that answer, <laughs> especially the, the very first part of it, a drop of the divine. How did you come to that insight, to this understanding, Michelle? Mm. Well, that would be a nice little story, I think, to kind of kick this off. Um, you know, I grew up um, in a household with lots of violence and trauma. And because of that, I grew up very agnostic and atheist. Um, and it wasn't until I, many, many years ago, uh, later, I should say, um, began my own healing process from my trauma that little by little, um, did I come to see who I was. So I began to learn about the different parts of me and also that lo and behold, at the core of who I was or who I am is this really vast, um, really infinite place. And once I got in touch with that place, the the different parts of me 
began to um, not identify themselves with me. They, they knew those parts of me, knew that they were not the core of me. And in that, it's like this shift in awareness, shift in identification. And that's kind of how, I guess, in a very succinct way, that's kind of how it, it unfolded through my life is through trauma, through healing of the trauma, to getting to who I really am. And that's often the case with most of us, uh, from what I can see, my own experience too, it comes from that. And I often ask the question here, is that what it takes, trauma and suffering, to awaken that part of us, which is not really a part, it's the whole of us? Or we can learn, we can become aware of that wholeness without the suffering and the pain. Yeah, right. Yeah, good question. And I, I truly believe we don't have to have gone through trauma. I know uh, uh, several people who had um, really good upbringings, and they seem to have had intact with them um, already a, a knowing of who they were. Um, so that's on the fortunate end of the spectrum. And there's a wide spectrum. So it could be, you know, uh, some Buddha who is born and has beautiful parents and the society they're in, they're intact right away. And then there's those of us who have um, varying degrees of trauma on the other end of the spectrum and the whole wide um human experience range that we have that help us. You know, one of my teachers um, really believes that this, this earth we're on is a, a school for a school of hard knocks. <laughs> it's like this place where we are to really learn our lessons. And part of that is this awakening of who we are. Yeah. For some of us, it happens. For some of us, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Is that just odds, possibilities, um, or do you believe in something like being a soul and kind of planning our existence here, the lessons we'll learn and what experiences we have to go through? Is that something that you actually talk about or believe in? Uh, I believe in that. I don't talk too much about that. Um, yeah, that just hasn't come in the right um, circles quite um, often enough, but definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gives me a, it's almost like a, a pause in a way, because mm -hmm. the, the question is, does it ever end? <laughs> <laughs> Do we ever rest <laughs> from these lessons? <laughs> um, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, um, I will say we, we never really fully know, I guess. Mm -hmm. However, um, right. Right. I do have a, there's something really deep and strong inside of me that um, believes in the, uh, how do I want to phrase it correctly? Um, in the release of um, reincarnation, in, at least in coming here to earth again, um, maybe reincarnating into other larger realms as you know spiritual guides and teachers on that level but as far as re reincarnating back here on earth to continue i think once we do learn our full scope of teachings and learnings that we were given um per perhaps that's the case but one never knows i guess yeah you made me laugh with that a little bit in a sense of um uh, in a sense of almost comfort because I actually find comfort in not knowing, mm. in the unknown. So every time I hear that, you know, we don't, I don't know. Yeah. And um, we'll never know in a way with this mind that we operate from. Right. So another question, which is the, the question that I mentioned off record, is about spiritual enlightenment. So let me just ask Two questions in one. How do you define spirituality and what is spiritual enlightenment to you? Mm. So what is, uh, what, rephrase your first question, what is spiritual spirituality? Yeah, how do you define spirituality mm. or what would that be? Yeah, yeah I've never been asked to define that, so I'm going to go off the cuff here. Um, yeah, for me, I guess spirituality is just... Um, uh, 
a set of um, beliefs and activities or ways of being that connects us with something greater than ourselves. Um, doesn't have to be religious based. Um, yeah. One of the uh, contemplations I had was to know that I am that small <laughs> within this mm. human experience. I have to come from a larger kind of perspective because right. I can see the small me trying so hard in so many ways and going through so much. That's how I make sense of that larger kind of self because it, it's able to see actually the small one. Right, yeah. What is spiritual enlightenment, Michelle, to you? Yeah, that's been informed by my, by my process I talked about earlier, which is for me just really coming to know who we truly are at our core. It's uncovering those layers um, of us that, you know, in many ways it's like we are the sun and we're covered with lots of clouds or weather patterns and it's just coming to that center and living from that and identifying from that place. That resonates true to me as well. And it seems to be a practice. Would you call it a practice or a somewhat a destination for spiritual enlightenment? Yeah, no, I, I think it's definitely a practice. Um, and I think that if one were to think of it as a destination, um, I would welcome that from other people and also know that that um, if we get complacent in, in that, then we're kind of stuck back again in maybe some identification roles, but certainly a, definitely a practice to keep, um, in particular with my, my practice of, um, getting to know the different parts of us and having a deep self to part connection really fosters that, um, continuation of that practice and our parts not identifying themselves with us, mm -hmm. right? That's fascinating. I remember the first time I heard about parts work, and it was um, maybe last year, not too long ago. It kind of uh, made a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. And how did you discover IFS, which stands for Internal Family Systems? Yeah. Um, I had been um, seeing a therapist at the time. Um, I'd been with her for about three years doing Hakomi therapy. Um, in, I sought her out to help with um, PTSD symptoms and um, flashbacks and stuff I was having. And that was helpful and everything. But one day she did something completely different. And at the end of that session, I just said, whatever you just did today, I need to know about. And that's what we need to do for here going forward. And she said, oh, I just came back from an internal family systems um, training. And, you know, she explained a little bit about it. And I went home to research more about it. And within a few months, I was down in Esalen uh, with Dick Schwartz, who's the founder of the model. And it just made so much sense to me. And I felt I, what really happened for me, I think, is I really got in touch with my core self. I like had that first glimpse of that because beforehand I was just identifying with the very traumatized parts of me or the parts that strive and try to protect me in different ways. And there was that shift that day. Right. Wow. I heard about um, the effectiveness of it and how powerful it is. I, I think I, I interviewed lots of people here and most of them, of course, went through the process themselves. So they spoke from that first person. So that was fascinating. So in your book, Daily Parts Meditation Practice, a journey of embodied integration for clients and therapists. You say something interesting that caught my attention. Yeah, I think it was under Daily Parts Meditation Practice. You had selecting your parts, that was like uh, the first step. And then choose one part each day with which to spend time. So that caught my attention too. But then the second one, frequency of your meditation. Depending upon the number of parts you have, this might dictate how you will proceed with this right practice. So how do I know how many parts do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, that caught my attention immediately. <laughs> yeah, it's such a fun question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we all come equipped with as many parts as um, our systems needed to make it through our challenges. Um, so, you know, as a IFS practitioner, I am often asked that question, oh my gosh, how many parts do I have? And because I map people's systems as I'm working, I see, you know, a wide variety of, you know, it may be, you know, 20 or so parts and it may be up to a hundred. It just depends. And if we, part of my um, message is if we slow down enough and, and truly form the self to part relationship with each part, they're, um, they're little beings inside of us because we were human or we're human, right? And we were little at different ages or, and these parts of us are real. And so if we get to know them on that level, as if they're like children in a classroom and we know each child and their history, um, then we know how many parts we have because we've kind of been able to know them fully. So that's a, <laughs> a kind of a winding road to your uh, answer to your question, but yeah. 20 to 200. That's incredible. And the way to identify them is to go through the process, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really just slowing down, getting to know them. Yeah. I would love for you to go deeper into it, but we won't have enough mm -hmm. time. Probably it will be a session, right, in itself. <laughs> so I'll keep the questions open. I have another question about the obstacles to healing. What are they? What were they for you? And what do you see most? Do you see one kind of obstacle showing up more than others? Mm, good question. Well, I think there it kind of starts in a twofold system. One is our external constraints. So maybe we're in an environment or a family structure or our, our work situation, something in our external environment doesn't give us the sense that it's the right timing. So maybe we're in a bad relationship where it doesn't, it's maybe literally not safe to do the inner work yet um, until we're out of that relationship. Um, maybe we're, for for numbers of reasons, something in our external world is kind of um, constraining that process. And then the other piece would be the internal constraints. Those would be our own parts that um, tell us things that we can't do, right? Maybe we've got an inner critic that says, you know, there's no way you can heal through this or, you know, why bother? Nothing ever works. Um, so we might have some internal constraints that make it hard. And so, you know, if, if we take the external constraints aside for a minute and just work with the internal constraints, and we begin a, a gentle inquiry and in getting to know the parts with that. And they begin to feel our essence or our self um, at the core. That self to part relationship often is enough to begin shifting us onto that path of, okay, we can now begin to take some steps towards this and just continue to listen to other parts that say other things about why we can't or shouldn't do the process. I love the way you say that is that listening it's mm -hmm. slowing down and listening. That is so true because it seems like the parts, they almost automated, <laughs> programmed mm -hmm. to just show up immediately and, and react to whatever it is. Yeah, I have, yes. I have seen, of course, I pay attention. I'm very self-aware and I see that. What does it feel like to integrate all these parts? Like mm. from your perspective now, how do you see the world yourself? What does it feel like? I, I love that question so much as you read it. I noticed instantly inside of me the different parts of me um, going, they just feel acknowledged with that. So, and that may sound kind of a little weird of a statement, but what that means for me is that it, I'm really embodied in the moment, really moment to moment. So, because I know my system so well, because I, I truly know each of my parts and their histories and their healing process so intimately, they trust my self-leadership is what, one of the phrases we use in IFS. Um, 
they trust me as myself to lead. And so every moment to moment, I'm either in myself or I'm aware of the different part or parts of me that are blended to some different degrees, um, embodied in that moment with whatever tasks I need to do or how I'm, you know, engaging in my life. So it's a really embodied sense of a deep, intimate knowledge of myself. You know, that phrase, know thyself, that's a really deeply embodied felt sense of that is to really intimately know yourself by knowing your part so deeply. And as I said earlier, when they don't identify as you, as yourself, and you have that relationship with them, it's just a very cozy, intimate place for conversations and Yes, it feels like it to me <laughs> from you. It's um, it's that sense of um, of inner peace. That's what I call it. Just uh, it's easy to be in the moment. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to also just acknowledge um, part of that inner peace feeling is stems from my very long history of of working through the IFS model to heal my trauma. And so my parts are not burdened anymore, which has the the sense of peace inside. And so I just want to, I don't want your listeners to have a false sense of hope of like, oh, if I get to know my parts, I'll just be at peace. That's part of the process is first getting to know them, but also really deeply witnessing them and helping them to unburden so that they are at peace. Because when each of our parts are at peace, there's much more peace inside. What comes to mind is, I have to ask you this question now, um, how many parts did you find in yourself? Yeah, uh, I just, I learned of a new one just um, this summer, but um, I have 31 parts. Um, and one, I should say actually 37, because there's a group of them that like to be called the traveling Wilburys, but there's six of them within there. Um, but they kind of want to be identified as a group. But if you count them as individuals in 37. so Those parts that you have identified, even the ones that are almost like in a group, are they coming from all this human experience you had here in this lifetime? Or are they actually, some of them are related to, obviously, uh, your ancestry and also past lives? Mm. Oh, I love that. Um, I would say they're all related to my human experience here. Um, but some of them have definitely legacy, um, heritage within them, meaning, you know, from my ancestors. And I do have one part that she's quite busy in the background until I get, until I get my memoir done, then her next thing is on the docket, which is integrating my past lives. So she's kind of, has this uh, reservoir, I guess, of my past lives. So I haven't had the time to dive deep into that facet yet. But when you ask about, are these parts my human incarnated parts, I guess, rephrasing your question is yes. And um, there's this piece that I'm so curious to get to know about my past life. I mean, I, I know about some of my past lives, but this yeah. one's like, no, I've got all of them <laughs> mm, wow. here for you when you're ready. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge that I am very in touch with some of my own guides. So external um, positive influences that really have helped my life as well that are not parts of me. When you say guides, are they in the body or without the body? Without, yeah. Without the body, right. It's amazing how much trust, right, Michelle? That's what I hear, too, from you. It's over and over again. Everything you say, it's translated to me into trust. Like this very powerful sense of trust happening, just this movement, uh, energetic kind of uh, resonance. That trust really is a multi-layered system of trust really you know my parts trusting me and me trusting the divine or um guides and my parts 
trusting them because of me. And so it's like a multi-layer trust system. But yes. So when you say me within that duality conversation, when you say me, what is the me? How do you identify the me Mm -hmm. in there? Yeah, that goes back to my kind of original definition of enlightenment or awakening um, is really knowing who we are at our true core self. To me, that's that place that is the drop of the divine. Um, Not to get too jargony, but uh, in IFS, we think of self as both a wave state and a particle state. So in the wave state of self, it's that expansive divine bigger energy that we are also and the the particle form of self is that drop of the divine so it's it's both and it's it's holding that that we are much bigger than this human experience and because we are here we have parts so i am the self that has parts and these parts when especially when they're unburdened, have much more of their own self in them as well. It's fractal. They cannot be separated. It's just yeah. one, but it is experienced as two. Mm-hmm. But it's just a form, right? Right. You wrote the book, Daily Parts Meditation Practice, a journey of embodied integration for clients and therapists. Did you set an intention From the very beginning, I know you wrote this in the book too, so I would love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. I actually had no intention of writing this book whatsoever. Um, I had been planning to go see Dick Schwartz at Esalen again, um, which which turned out to be a regular occurrence for me. Um, My therapist at the time had highly suggested I show him my parts pendants, um, which if you have the book, you'll see them in there and my parts maps. And when I did that, he just said, oh my gosh, you have to come sit down and show this to me. So I explained to him what this was, and we can talk a little bit about that too. But the the outcome of, of that was he said, you know, I would really like you to present about this at the annual IFS conference. And as I was beginning to put together a PowerPoint and some handouts for people, I thought I would provide like a, you know, 20 or 30 page handout guide for them. And as I worked, it became very clear it was a book. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it just unfolded mm-hmm. into this book process. Now it might be the best time to talk about those tools. So the process really in the book, you have parts, timelines, parts, catalog, cards, and then parts, biographies, parts, maps, you just mentioned, parts, externalizations, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, and then daily parts, meditation practice. If you Mm -hmm. could, that'd be wonderful to go through them briefly. Yeah. Um, So all of these tools are meant to... um, help with between IFS sessions. Um, So if anyone's engaged within IFS sessions or wants to be, these would be helpful tools to integrate your work. Um, Parts timelines are simply just um, as the process unfolds in IFS, listing the parts that come up and the order they're coming up in. And that goes back to your question earlier, Valerie, as how how many parts do we have? So if if within each session we are just writing down the names of the parts that come up, we have them. And because of, we, of writing them down in the, in the order they come up, we begin to easily put them into a map, which is the next one, parts maps. And we see the relationships between the parts because our parts have relationships with each other. We have protector parts that protect exile parts of us and so on. So we can list out our parts, we can map them. And then from those um, named parts, we can begin to catalog them in what I call parts catalog cards, which is really a a brief history, like it's a a scaffolding or a a template of what our um, parts have gone through. 
And in particular with IFS, we go through an unburdening process, that lightening of releasing burdens. And so on the front parts of the parts catalog cards is we catalog exactly what burdens were released and how, um, what qualities, natural qualities came back in and what their new roles are. And from that, we can create parts biographies. And that comes to one of the um, benefits of the DPMP, which is um, deepening our coherent narratives. Like Daniel Siegel talks about, you know, having a coherent narrative of your, of your life by creating a unique, it's almost like it's a, a biography of just one piece of you, right? Because of that one particular event you went through or time period and you know it very intimately you can create a biography about that and when you do that with all of your parts together what you end up with a memoir which I'm trying to write right now um, really deepening that integration and then parts externalizations are a really fun creative process by you know, asking each part what kind of object or image or it could be a song or a body movement of some sort that really represents them, right? And how do we want to capture that? could be anything that the part wants. And by having something, at least for me, I'm very visual, so mine are parts pendants. By having those, when I look at them, um, it's an unblending process. In IFS, we have this term blending, which means our parts kind of, it's the clouds covering up the sun, it's the parts covering up self. And so to see those externalizations helps with unblending. And the, it's kind of that invitation for the parts automatically to go, oh, I'm not Michelle or I'm not all of Michelle. Um, and it's an honoring of what they've gone through, especially when you do it um, post unburdening. And then the last one is the daily parts meditation practice, which is you're beginning to kind of name some of the ways of which you can create your own daily parts practice of having a um, a meditation time inside. Really, f for me, it be oh, it, all of my meditations begin with inviting all parts to gather around. And then inviting them to slowly just give a, enough space that they're not blended. Maybe it's like a campfire or a table of um, school children around you or something where they give space enough to let you be in yourself, embodied in yourself. And spending some time just in self-energy or being in yourself and connecting with the, the bigger self, the source, the divine. And from there, um, if you have um, knowledge of your parts, you can begin to have a, a daily connection with each part. So, And that's where it can get really fun how you're going to do that. But um, yeah, having a daily practice with each part, deepening that self-depart relationship, and then coming back at the very end into yourself again and inviting all parts to witness this because ultimately they would like the same experience. So it's like, if you give this part time today, you're going to have your time. Maybe it's tomorrow or next week or something, right? There's, there becomes a lot more patience inside for, mm -hmm. um, having turns, so to speak inside. Mm -hmm. So those are the six tools. How wonderful. I mean, listening to you, it sounds like meditation itself. Mm-hmm. It's almost like I don't want to say that, but I will because I see this term differently these days. The ego, is that the parts, are they considered the ego? Or yes, they definitely. Are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because it's, um, I know in some spiritual circles, um, eliminating the ego yeah. is kind of the idea. And um, I want to just gently let people know that it's it's not possible to eliminate our parts. Um, and if we're trying to, that's coming from other parts wanting to exile or eliminate other parts. Um, yeah, what we want is those parts to trust in ourself, to be, you know, good servants, so to speak, to be helpful 
um, colleagues along the way to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how can this part of me who, who likes writing be beneficial in my in my life instead of me identifying with a writer? You know, right? Oh, I love that. Right, I love that, Michelle. What can I say? Mm-hmm. I remember listening to somebody who said that in a beautiful way. I love how you say that too, in a gentle way. I think he or she, he said, uh, yeah, I see the ego as a baby. Would you ignore a baby? Mm -hmm. Uh, We wouldn't, (laughs) right? We would try to protect it. Yeah. So I give it direction, guidance. Right. And, And to acknowledge that there might be another part of you who would want to ignore the baby. Ah, right. Yes, and that's the one right. trying to get rid of it and to just right. get very open heartedly curious with that one mm. as well, because that's just another piece of the ego or another part of us as well. That must be an amazing work to do. So thank you so much, Michelle. I love that. I mean, it's a work that I always, at this point in my life, I'm very much aware of the parts and I don't know how I'm doing this, but they are really directed and guided or perhaps they are trusting the divine self to do the work that it, whatever I do, it's um, beneficial for this, which I call self, the body and the mind and others around me. So Mm -hmm. I think I don't know how I, I have an idea because I have been very curious about spirituality and that's what I do pretty much every day. Mm-hmm. I love, absolute love. You probably heard about Advaita Vedanta. That's one of the mm-hmm. teachings I follow. There's a sense of trust right here. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I was, it's, to me, it sounds like just different parts of you are in touch with their own self or self energy that's accumulating for your whole system, right? It's just every, there's that deeper trust that we talked about earlier. I would like to mention too that there's an app, it's called FIS based app called Centaur, I believe. I would love to hear a little bit more about it. And also the, um, you have released the DPMP MP3 set of meditations that was in 2021 last year. And then also the Spanish version is being released this year, this fall. That's right. Yeah. So talk to me a bit more about that, those yeah, projects. Yeah. So Center, it's spelled S-E-N-T-U-R. It's an IFS inspired app. And um, there are many, many tools in there to help you get to know parts, um, get to unblend from parts. And get to catalog your parts. So they they collaborated with me about a year ago. And many of my tools are um, embedded now within the app. So if perchance anyone is already an IFS um, person and they've unburdened a part, you can toggle the part um, that you've put into the app as unburdened and it will lead you through my series of meditations to continue that self-depart relationship. Um, so those are all within there along with many other people's, um, meditations and ways of connecting with parts. So it's a beautiful way to just, um, deepen the work, um, deepen your integration. So there's that the daily parts meditation practice, um, series of meditations that came out last year are now available also in Spanish on my website and there's six different meditations. There's the original one that's talked about in the book, um, along with a few other ones. So if you're just beginning the process, you can begin to just get to know some parts of yourself and start from the beginning. Mm, wonderful. Yes. Michelle. And the, and the book did officially come out, um, in Spanish two weeks ago. So that's uh, available as well. I'll be doing some now Spanish, um, daily parts uh, workshops coming up in the next year. Wonderful. And the best way to find you, would that be the website to have access to all these tools? Yeah, there's two of them. You could you can see find me on my website, which is um, the listener com, And you'll probably put that in the notes somewhere. And then also I have a, a Facebook page. So if you look for daily IFS daily parts meditation practice, um, there's a public one for anybody. And then if you have the book and are using it and you want to join the private one, you can do that too. 
So there's those ways. Wonderful. I'll have the website link on your podcast profile. That will be there. Mm -hmm. And we're almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. But before that, would you like to add anything that you left unsaid or read a passage in your book? I have to say that I love the poem, Behold Yourself. (laughs) That's Uh, a beautiful poem. That is a beautiful, that's one of my favorite poems. Um, I would like to read um, a passage because it touches on, I think, everything we've talked about. Um, It's kind of a synopsis, if you will, and then a starting place, too, for people. So it says, Lastly, while I came to recognize IFS as one means for awakening, it has been my experience that the daily parts meditation practice augments spiritual enlightenment. As we all begin our own journeys home to our true selves and come to know the various parts that are contained within, we come to identify less as those individual parts of us and more as our true selves. Throughout our IFS healing sessions, our parts gain more and more trust in us or ourselves, in part because of the relationships we build with our parts and because we gain momentary experiences of being our true selves. When we sustain these inner relationships on a daily basis, we are able to consciously hold our ego states as simple, albeit very real, parts of us that do complete our human experience and do and yet do not define us. Many spiritual practices focus on eliminating ego or parts, in essence, exiling them altogether or once again for the sake of self. Instead, with this process, we integrate our parts and hold them inclusive, all the while coming deeper and more fully into ourselves. Over time with the DPMP, our frequent sense and embodiment of self expands as we awaken more and more while we hold our parts. Never underestimate the power of unblending from parts. Each unblending is another layer of awakening. Mm. Yes, beautifully written and stated. I read that. I had um, a lot of questions about it, but then we talked earlier. (laughs) We just disclosed all that kind of uh, unpacked. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thank you so much, Michelle, again, for being you in this this expression of you in this human experience with all the parts coming together and finally being this <laughs> that I'm listening today. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And thank you, Valerie, for being who you are, for your curiosity and for bringing um, myself and all the other people that you've brought into your um, podcast to help others as we're all on our paths. Mm, yes, I, I often say the body appreciates, but the parts appreciate mm-hmm. <laughs> that I guess they're listening. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is so cute in a way. I never use that word, but today came to me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see the ending questions. I'll ask you this one. At this time, what do you feel is the world's greatest need? Mm, I think the world's greatest need is connection. I think we're so divided and divisive and isolated and separate and we're all connected and we just need a lot more connection. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Infinite yes is to that connection. Although we already connected, but there's uh, that that feeling, the sense that we are not. Right. Um, Right. There's an illusion that we're not connected and, and when our parts feel disconnected from ourselves, we feel disconnected from others. And if we can connect with one another, I think a lot of the difficulties drop away. Yes. Yeah. By connecting with ourselves first. Mm-hmm. I love that uh, that order because it's another one that finally I came to understand. I tried to connect with others before connecting with myself and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So my last question is, what three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body, before they die? Mm. Mm. What three things? Firstly, I really would wish them, I would wish their parts to know deep connection with themselves. Like, and, and with that, that awareness of who they really are. Um, I would wish that they 
were able to make any re- repairs that were necessary in their lives with their, both with ourselves and others to feel that completion. Um, and the third thing, I wish them surrender and trust in knowing where they've been and where they're going next. I've never thought of that question, but I like it. And Thank you so much again, Michelle, for your presence here today. Again, for everything that you've been doing, the work within yourself, and then passing that on, that wisdom on to others. Mm -hmm. And before we say goodbye again, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, thelistenerllc.com and then the Daily Parts Meditation Practice on Facebook. Wonderful. Thank you, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Michelle Glass and her work, please visit thelistenerllc.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.